Okay. Hi, everyone. This is a QR code. Thank you very much, first of all, for joining me today, being that this is the last session of the day uh, before the ending keynote, of course, uh, which I invite you to um, see after this. Um, yeah, I see all of you already uh, thought about what's about the QR code. We have to scan it probably because that's why it's there. Uh, so yes, do scan it. It's only your name there. And the reason I ask you to scan this and fill in your name is because at the end I, I want to give a copy of this. It's like this one here. It's signed if you want, uh, but at the very end. So uh, I'm not sure if I can. Uh, <laughs> So, like this? <laughs> Is it better? Um, okay, so I'm gonna wait a bit for all of you to get ready with the QR code, and then we're gonna dive a bit into discussing uh, the latest Spring security version and all the changes you need to know if you want to upgrade, especially if you want to upgrade uh, to Spring Boot 3, which is um, the latest ma major version that has been released somewhere in November last year, so um, recently. Okay, I see no more phones, only a couple, <laughs> and then we can start. Um, okay, I guess this is it. Cool. So, guys, we discuss Spring Security 6, and of course, I will. I uh, deal with it in the context of upgrading to Spring Boot 3, because I think uh, how many of you actually use Spring Boot here? Quite a lot, and those of you who don't use Spring Boot, you might use it in the very near future anyway. So it's quite a popular framework in the Java ecosystem, isn't it? And if you use Spring Boot, and if you use Spring, you most likely also secure your applications with Spring Security, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know everything that changed, and as you will see, a lot of things changed recently. So I want to make you aware in today's talk about all the needed changes. And so what, what we'll do is we will go fast through some slides, and I will show you the changes, I will explain them, but then we will uh, jump in a coding example where I have an application, a small demo application, uh, application built with Spring uh, Boot 2.6, and I want to upgrade it live with you uh, to Spring Boot 3 and see how it goes. So that, that's exactly what we are going to do today. And then at the very end, uh, we'll do a random um, and uh, uh, I will give you the promised book. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Laurenzi, you can find me on social media. Actually, most of uh, the people know me as the guy who talks loudly. Uh, a little uh, part of the people know me for the YouTube channel and the books that I wrote. Um, and yeah, today what we'll discuss you can't even find with ChatGPT because it seems it's a little bit outdated in terms of Spring Security. So um, thank you for joining. You you couldn't simply just search it on ChatGPT and Google very easily. So I promise you I will give you some content of value today. So Spring Security, first of the changes, and the mo I, I believe to be the major one, is uh, the fact that the Web Security Configurer Adapter class, which um, is... Um, uh, a foundation of how Spring Security architecture was built for web applications uh, completely disappears. So in Spring Boot 2.7, you would already see it as being marked as deprecated, as you will see, starting with Spring Boot 3, uh, is completely removed. So you will have a compilation error if you don't remove it yourself. So what's to be done, first of all, is to cut out the uh, extends part. And then, of course, you'll end up with an overriding method that doesn't compile anymore because you don't override anything since you don't extend the class. So that one changes to a bean. And this is actually uh, great because uh, it, it, it improves a lot of flexibility in configuration. You weren't able to have easily multiple classes uh, wi with uh, configurations for Spring Security without um, running into uh, cyclic dependencies and stuff like that. Uh, some of you who might work on that, you have already faced uh, such situations uh, where you had to, to solve in difficult ways um, configuration manners that, that made things uh, difficult to, to read in the end. So because when you, usually when you split the configuration files into multiple configuration files, you do that to keep the single responsibility and make the things easier to understand. But you ended up making the configuration a little bit more difficult to understand. So with having 
uh, the uh, extension removed, so you don't have to inherit the class uh, anymore. Uh, you don't uh, stick your Spring Security configuration to one main class. First of all, you can have multiple bins thread spread throughout multiple configuration files, and, and that's basically um, one of the advantages. And the second advantage is, of course, the testability, because now you suddenly have a bin in the context, so it's very easy to test it as well. Uh, so it's easier to test your configuration. Uh, and of course, being that you, uh, you only now have to declare bins in the context, it's also e easier to inject them uh, here and there, and that, uh, that makes uh, things easier in solving the cyclic, um, the cyclic dependency. Um, then, of course, uh, if it's a bean now, uh, before we had a, a void method, it was called from the upper class, um, it changed to a bin, so it has to return something. So the build method has been introduced to the HTTP security object. Uh, it automatically returns the security filter chain. Uh, and you can even have multiple security filter chains because you can anytime put the order annotation and uh, order them in the way you'd like to be considered uh, by the framework. Um, then we have some other smaller things that you will see me uh, putting in um, uh, code uh, soon. Uh, one of them is uh, the authorized requests method, uh, which now changed the name to authorized HTTP requests. And as you will see, uh, now this example focuses on the authorized requests method, but then usually it's not any request what you'd call, it's basically MVC matchers, sound matchers, or regex matchers. Uh, and we don't have any more those matchers. So it, that's a fundamental part of Spring Security that has been removed, but at uh, the very end, in my experience, it's one that would create the most confusion. So I've seen a lot of people just using ant matchers, for example, instead of NVC matchers, because they simply didn't know the difference. And if you would search on an example on the web, like on Stack Overflow, um, you would uh, most likely find examples with ant matchers. Uh, do you actually know the difference between ant matchers and MVC matchers, by the way, if you are using Spring Security like an older version? See, you should. So, yeah. It's about path. That's a very good one. So the, with ant matchers, you have to uh, explicitly write the exact expression that matches all the paths that you want. But you know what? MVC itself, when it's configured, it might have multiple paths depending on your configuration. So you might end up having to configure your, your expression with ant matchers for multiple paths. But the problem is that this uh, set of paths might change only through a configuration matter, or it might even change from like an upgrade of a version to an upgrade of a version. And yes, I know you all have tests there that co covers 100% all the cases, uh, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you have to be to be really attentive not to introduce a vulnerability where you, you thought you covered all the paths, but you didn't cover. If you use MVC matchers, then you know at least that it covers everything that MVC itself configures. So you don't have to explicitly write all the ANT expressions uh, covering all the, all the cases. So see, this, this is a, a very uh, important point. It, it's essential for securing your applications, and it was creating a lot of confusions, and many developers that I've met didn't even know the difference. They were simply just using unmatchers because that's how the example looked like on the internet. Uh, with taking this out and having only one method, uh, we actually also take out all the confusion that would have been created this way. So that the fact that we quit using MVC matchers, request uh, MVC matchers and matchers and uh, regex matchers uh, is a good point. So um, yeah. The authorized requests uh, is not available anymore. You change this with authorized HTTP requests. And then, of course, as I previously mentioned, you can't use any more ANT matchers, MVC matchers, and regex matchers, and you will replace everything with request matchers, which is the only one and only method. So now you can't make a mistake anymore, okay? You only have one choice, so that's fine. Um, and one interesting thing is the access method as well that changes syntax. So as you will see, it won't uh, compile anymore in our example when we will upgrade. Um, access was used to take as a parameter a spring expression language expression, a spell expression. 
uh, like in my example here, for example, access is authenticated, you wouldn't usually use that, it's just in my uh, very simplistic um, demonstration here to, to allow you focus on the thing. So it would have taken directly a string as a parameter and uh, you would have written there any kind of spell. Uh, now, it doesn't take a string, I'm not sure, uh, I, I hope that all of you even from behind you can see, it's taken an object called an authorized manager as a parameter and that way it allows you to implement any kind of logic. So. Being that it doesn't take uh, the Spring expression language, it means that it makes things more difficult uh, to, uh, for you to upgrade. Uh, and of course, to make things easy, Spring Security comes with a, a class already, with an implementation called Web Expression Authorization Manager, which is, Im is an implementation of the contract that the new access method takes. Uh, and it allows you to still have a logic based on your Spring expression language. Now, if you want to trust me, I do not recommend you um, use a lot spell expressions. So this change where you will introduce, as we will do now, an object that still takes a Spring expression language as a parameter, it's for you to upgrade. If you have something like this, and especially if your Spring expression language is a complex one, not just is authenticated, I totally, uh, avoid, and I don't recommend the use of complex Spring expression language expressions, uh, especially, especially at the authorization configuration at the endpoint level. Why? Because it's difficult to understand, and it's also it becomes difficult to maintain. Uh, if you have to um, to debug something like a 403 forbidden and you don't know where it comes from, it will be a lot more difficult to debug a Spring expression language than to debug actual code. So you see, if you have something like this, first step, you upgrade to the uh, Web Expression Authorization Manager and then later you completely replace this with a proper implementation of the Authorization Manager that implements your uh, authorization logic, of course. See, so the Web Expression Authorization Manager is an implementation provided by Spring Security to allow you to simply um, upgrade your code. You can still keep it if you have maybe a simple Spring Expression language, you don't have to uh, change it completely, but uh, again, my recommendation is uh, you don't um, uh, abuse of using spell expressions. And then we have a very simple but very useful, um, let's say, addition, the um, annotation that was named enable global method security, and that was used to enable the entire aspect-based authorization on methods that uh, either pre-post authorized, pre-post filter annotations, secured annotations, uh, roles allowed. So these are the six annotations um, that are enabled. There are three different aspects, actually, three different aspects. Uh, enabling, enabling in total of, of uh, six annotations. We usually use the pre-post annotations, those four that I mentioned, so pre-authorized, post-authorized, pre-filter, post-filter. Uh, to enable them, you would have add on your configuration the enable global method security, and then you had to uh, explicitly enable one or more of the three aspects. And you usually, let's say in more recent applications, you would uh, enable the pre-post uh, annotations using the pre-post enable true. What all happens is that the secured and the roles allowed, they were there anyway for compatibility purposes for transitioning uh, from different technologies to spring. So you usually didn't end up using them too long. So you had to explicitly enable the flag when you could have simply just uh, assume that you will use pre-post. So why, why should that be on false on default? So what, this, what does this do is, of course, uh, besides simplifying the name of the annotation itself, the global there disappears, which anyway had no meaning, if you if you'd ask me. Uh, the pre-post enable is by default true, so you will not need to specify it anymore. 
And then, of course, uh, a couple more additions, but that I will not uh, enter into details too much today, but I have different talks about, is the Spring Security Authorization Server. So um, my previous talk at Vox Cluj was about it, and if you don't know what the Spring Security Authorization Server is, I do recommend you find either uh, some talk that I have given at a previous conference um, or find me on YouTube and I have plenty of things described about uh, the authorization server usage from the simple cases to multi-tenancy. Um, Spring Security Authorization Server is a framework allowing you to implement from scratch easily an authorization server and through that avoid the use of a third party where that's not possible. So for example, there are organizations or projects that don't allow the use of Keycloak, Okta, or something else similarly that you could use to implement OAuth 2 and OpenID, and you need to build something custom. If you need to build some, something custom with Spring, you have the Spring Security Authorization Server whose version 1.0.0 has been released in still in November last year. So uh, it's quite a new piece of software. And yeah, we have version one. Uh, you just have to add one dependency and then it comes with everything out of the box and it's very easy to implement. Trust me, you find me implementing that in uh, several videos over the web. And then I will talk ob uh, about also the resource server that now enters the de in the uh, definition of the DSL configuration in Spring Security. So unlike the previous way of implementing a resource server where you had to use specific annotations, like the enable resource server for those of you who might remember, now you don't need such specific annotations and the only uh, thing you need to do is to use the proper uh, DSL method in the configuration. So instead of having specific annotations, the only thing you need to do is to use the DSL OAuth to resource server. And then you have, of course, different ways in which you can, can configure it, either uh, via um, uh, the key set, uh, if it's JWT or um, uh, OPAC tokens, they are separately implemented, or you can even customize it to use one or more uh, authorization servers. Okay, enough talking. Let's go to a bit of code. So let me open my IntelliJ here, and I, I, I hope that you can all see uh, it on the screen now. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to go to my POM XML and prove you that this is a Spring Boot using version 2.6.0. So what we'll do now is because uh, I don't have a lot of time, uh, I will directly uh, change it to 3.0.0 or 3.0.3 the last one, I, I think, but it doesn't really make a lot of a difference. Um, but what uh, usually uh, people recommend is if you have a lower version than 2.7, like 2.6 in my case, or sometimes even lower, like in my, my previous project where I, I've, I've done this last time, uh, I had 2.3 and I had to upgrade it to 3. Uh, so if you find this too much work, it might be easier if you first move it to 2.7 and then to 3. So that, that's a trick. S for, for some cases, it's one more step, but you have less things to change to 2.7 and then uh, less things to change from 2.7 to 3. So yeah, I will use 3 directly, but take that into consideration. If you, if you find it too, um, too difficult, uh, then try upgrading first to 2.7. Okay, let me reload the project, see what happens. I guess we will already have some, some compilation problems, even starting with the POM XML file. Okay, exactly. So I'm, I'm using uh, a MySQL server. Uh, this is basically, I, I didn't go through all the classes, but it's only a very, very small project with an endpoint using method authorization. Uh, I've used also, uh, see, the web security configure adapter, the way it used to be, um, and um, uh, the access method, so we can see the change in that case. And I'm, I'm simply having my users in a table in a database, and I, I grab them from there and I do the authentication. So I somewhere have uh, a user details service implementation that grabs the user details from the database and serves them to Spring Security. So the, the project is very simple, but I try to cover as much as possible all the main cases that I've shown you a little bit earlier. So uh, being that I'm using MySQL and the MySQL 
uh, dependency changed, that it was moved on a different group. So it's something like this, called MySQL now. Okay, first of all, I have to start from there and make sure that all my POM XML file is in right order. And then of course, uh, I, I will still have uh, compilation problems because, um, well, as I, I've mentioned, the web security configure adapter completely disappeared. If I would have moved to 2.7, it would have still worked, but it was like uh, crossed over with a line, meaning it's deprecated. In 2.7, that's why I said upgrading first to 2.7, it might be an easier process. Um, now I, I have to completely remove it because otherwise it won't compile. Um, and then we already know that enable global method security um, should be changed to enable method security, and then you can see that this became grayed out, meaning that it's already true by default. If, if you use pre-post enabled, like pre-authorized, post-authorized, then you don't need to explicitly specify it. You can just cut it directly and that's it. If you use secured or the JSR250, which means the roles allowed, uh, you sh still should put them explicitly on true, but uh, again, that's probably rarely happening. Uh, and if it's happening in your project, I still recommend you change them with pre post authorize at some point, okay? Uh, and then of course, the override doesn't make sense anymore, so I, I just replace it with uh, the bin annotation because I know that uh, I will need to have a bin of uh, type security filter chain in the end. You can name it whatever you want. Uh, the HTTP security is a bin in the spring context, so I don't have to do anything special about it. It will be automatically injected here. That's it. Uh, and then the authorized requests doesn't exist. Yeah? Okay, sorry for that, yeah, yeah, because you're from behind, you, you can't see that. Uh, so I, uh, again, I removed the override, I have made it a bin, it's a security filter chain bin, and then of course I change authorized requests with HTTP requests, this now becomes the only request matchers annotation, so that's everything you need to change. Uh, and at the very end, you have to return the bin, so we, we remember that we have a build method now creating that bin. I still have to do something with the access method that, as mentioned a little bit earlier, doesn't take a string as a parameter anymore now. So I need to uh, use the authorization manager object. And what I wanna show you first, so this is the authorization manager contract, the interface. And here are several implementations that you can use. We will use the a uh, web expression authorization manager, that is the implementation using a spring expression language. Uh, but first of all, there are multiple objects already provided by Spring Security, depending on the case. Take a look at them when you study this more in details. And secondly, remember this is made also to allow you to easily implement this contract yourself. So in the end, the contract itself, it's only a method, no, it's the check method. That's everything you need to implement. So, uh, so that's it. So now instead of having, say that I, I just want to um, upgrade and I don't have now the time to remove that is authenticated and uh, implement it myself, I can do that as a first step, just replace it with an object of type web expression authorization manager and that's everything I need to do. Um, and yeah, that's uh, mainly it. Oh, we still have a few things that will still not compile since I changed from version 2.6 to 3. I all also changed from Java E to Jakarta E. So all the packages with Java X um, have now to be replaced with Jakarta. So that's not Spring Security, but if you want your application um, to completely work, you need to do that. Normally you'd replace them um, automatically with a find replace. There are some tools out there that have been created to help you um, upgrade. To be honest with you, I didn't need the use of, uh, of those tools. Um, I could easily upgrade my services um, just with a replace. Um, but yeah, if you find that uh, useful, so you can, you can actually do that as well. You can, um, use one of those tools. So let's see if my application starts. 
okay? And it looks like I did everything I needed to do to make it work, which is fine. Uh, so you see, it, it wasn't that difficult, uh, but now it's a lot more robust in, in terms of code and, and easier both to understand and configure. Since I have some time, uh, I would like to also um, reflect a bit on the about the resource server, because I've said previously, if you have used um, an um, OAuth 2 or OAuth in general, it was OAuth 1 actually with the, the um, Spring Security OAuth project. Um, if you used an OAuth implementation, you would have used the Spring Security OAuth dependency and then you would have probably annotated this class with uh, enable resource server. Uh, you would have implemented a token store. So there are a few things that, that you, you needed to do in order to configure uh, the resource server. Uh, now things are a lot easier. Uh, so uh, Spring Security provides out of the box an implementation for a simple JWT in case you use non-opaque tokens. JWTs are non-opaque tokens. Uh, it also provides the configuration for opaque tokens out of the box. So for example, I could simply just say, well, I have an authorization server that, that uses opaque tokens, and the only thing I need to specify is what is the introspection URI that my resource server would use to validate that specific opaque token. So you know, opaque tokens, they don't contain data. So to be validated, the resource server needs to ask the authorization server, is this token a valid one? And it does that through the introspection URI. Or if I have a simple implementation of OAuth2 uh, with, uh, with non-opaque tokens, uh, the JWT support uh, comes out of the box. Uh, and then um, the simplest implementation is providing directly the uh, key set URI, uh, telling the resource server, hey, this is the, UR the, the URI where you will find the set of public keys that you can use to test the tokens and validate them if uh, they uh, have been or not altered throughout uh, uh, the, um, uh, their, their sending throughout the network or uh, if uh, someone else has cre created them. Um, and if you have more complex stuff to do, it's still very easy. It only has one object you have to implement in that case. So say it's real world and it's a jungle out there. So you can't always rely that your authorization server is perfectly uh, re resembling the OAuth 2 or OpenID Connect specification, okay? So there might be things that don't work the way you expect them to be or according to the specification. So what do you do that then? It means you can't create a Spring resource server? No, of course not. You can even use OAuth if you'd like. Uh, then the only thing you need to do is to, uh, of course, uh, write a little bit more code. So write a little bit uh, more customized implementation. You would have to implement um, a bin of type uh, authentication manager resolver, which is basically the manager directing to whatever authentication provider you want. So you can implement the authentication provider, which is the object implementing the authentication uh, logic in Spring Security, and you can write your custom implementation there that would fit with whatever you have in your particular example. So it's covering, in other words, absolutely all the cases to make your life, first of all, easier if everything is by the book, but easy still even if it's not by the book in your real-world scenario. Uh, and that's, uh, that's basically what I wanted to show you today. Uh, I forgot to say that you could have asked questions during the presentation, but since you didn't, uh, I wonder if you have questions now. Please. What I consider, so I, I usually avoid to have it on more than like one line. Usually if I have something like this and this, that's fine. That's okay. But trust me, I've seen exp Spring Expression languages on like 10 lines like this. There are one under the other. I've seen that in projects. And that's something I do recommend you avoid. <laughs> okay. Now, now previously, because uh, I, I was showing you here that I have a, a pre-authorized annotation that still works. So previously, what I would recommand when, when you have, because you will tell me, okay, but we have the pre-authorized annotation or the post-authorized. What do we do with that? I mean, you really need to write a Spring Expression language there. 
Well, in that case, what I do recommend is if it's a complex one, take it out in a bin, and then uh, just call the bin there. You can do that very easily. So Spring Expression Language automatically understands bins and parameters of the method. For parameters, you use a dash. Uh, it's very, very easy to put it there and call the logic in an object. Never use like a huge Spring Expression Language on your annotation. Move it in the code to be easier to debug. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, so the question was, what about testing my authorization, uh, my authorization configuration, especially if it's on the pre-authorized? Would I consider unit testing them or integration testing them? That's, that's I think, the question. Um, so first of all, Spring Security offers an entire suite of um, capabilities to uh, test uh, the to integration, to, to, is, to define integration tests on authorization uh, rules. Um, so you, you can use with mock user, for example, which is the easiest, with user details, and you can, e you can, you can even have a completely custom implementation for the integration test. Do I um, both write unit tests and integration tests? I think it depends. If it's a complex implementation here, I might want to also use write unit tests, but I'm not a fan of writing like duplicating my tests. So if it's not a complex implementation, I usually just write my integration test with Spring Security using with mock user or one or, or of the other options that I have, and that's, uh, that's enough for me as long as it covers all the cases. Cool, and we had one more there, yeah. Yeah, this is specific, yeah. This, this is uh, out of the box. So normally, normally you would have simply just define an object and then call the object method here yeah. through the name of the bin, yeah. But thi this is just one example because you will not probably do something like that is authenticated, it doesn't really make sense, okay? It's just for my example here to have, I didn't have something in my mind that's easier to put there, simpler to allow you focus on the pre and not on the expression, okay? <laughs> that's the point. Okay, other questions? And... I think we can call it then, but if you still have questions and didn't want to ask me now for several reasons, you will find me uh, tomorrow as well, today, the rest of the day. You can yeah, um, ask me anytime you find me, uh, anywhere you find me. And don't forget that you can always find me on social media as well. Most of you, I think, already do follow me. Um, and just before completely ending the presentation, I have a bad news and a good news. Um, the bad news is that Spring Security, like any other piece of software, um, is not perfect. So uh, there is a vulnerability that I, ha that I have just found about and uh, just wanted to make you sure that you know as well. So test if your applications have uh, and are affected by this vulnerability um, and do upgrade in case. See that it, it affects both version 6 and version 5.3. Uh, so they might affect you, just check that out. That's the bad news. Um, the good news is that someone will, oh, <laughs> oh no, my internet connection failed. Just give me like 30 seconds and I will make it work. Uh, and meanwhile, um, oh no, I don't see anything because, yeah, <laughs> because I still don't have. Um, Connected, fine. Um, that's one of it. And, and I hope I can see the entire list here. Uh, is anyone who still wants to scan the QR code? Now is the time. So I still have a, okay. So I, I will give you that chance to scan again the QR code in case you didn't. And then I will just click the button and if someone will win this copy, okay? <laughs> Sorry? It's here, it's not MIP. It's physical, you can touch it, see? Touch it. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, ev everyone's okay now, I guess. Is it? Okay, so let me check it again. I will refresh the page to make sure I take everyone's uh, addition. And 73 is the last one, okay? So it's starting with two, row two, to 73. Two to 73. 40. 40. Let's see who 40 is. Adrian. So how do I make it? Uh, first of all, I, I want to mark it somehow. Secondly, I'd like to make the font a bit. I don't know how to use this software, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Adrian Berejnik. I hope I correctly pronounced it, yeah? It's fine? Okay, then that's it. I call it an end. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. <laughs>